Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. This podcast is for the 25th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on November 10, 2024. And our readings are 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16. Our semi-continuous first reading is a second section of Ruth, chapter 3, 1 through 5, and then chapter 4, 13 through 17. Psalm 146, we continue through the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, 24 through 28. And then our gospel reading is Mark 12, 38 to 44. We also want to let you know, listeners, that this podcast is being recorded prior to September 10, and therefore prior to the election that we would have just had in, uh, if you are a listener in the United States. So we know nothing. <laughs> and there we have it. Yeah. And as we said last week, it's probably a good thing that we're not recording up to, as anxieties raise and all of that. Maybe we can just focus on the texts and the good news and the texts and not that we want to go. Our preaching is about blocking out all the unpleasantries of life, but sometimes it is. <laughs> our listeners in other countries are probably wondering when the next campaign season starts. And the answer is in about probably two months. We'll get, yeah, we'll get going yeah. in 2021. Yeah, if that. <laughs> yeah. So. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. So here we are in uh, Mark. We only have one more week of Mark, November 17, and then we switch gears into, a, into the new theological universe of Luke. So as I mentioned last week, I think one of the things that the preacher wants to do is reflect on your preaching over the year on Mark. What themes have you lifted up? What aspects of Mark have you felt that are important for your congregation to know? What what does how does this story tell about the good news of Jesus that you have felt as particularly meaningful for your congregation at this time and place? And how can you maybe reiterate some of those in these last two uh, these last two Sundays, if you are preaching on Mark and you are not going through Hebrews or Ruth or the semi-continuous. But just to mention that again, before we get to the text. And, but here, like last week we said, we had the nice, the good scribe, the thoughtful scribe, the questioning scribe, the scribe who is near the Seeking. kingdom seeking the kingdom. And now we have beware the scribes who like to walk around the long robes and be treated and greeted and uh, with respect in the marketplaces. And they have to have the best seats and the best places of honor at the banquets. So because what they bit, do after they get bit those wonderful, yeah. After they get those wonderful privileges with all of their power, they have no accountability. And so they devour the least, the the um, folks who need um, th th need them to use their influence influence to their benefits. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, you set uh, the uh, our preachers up real well for Caroline um, is think about how you've been going through Mark all along. If you've been preaching through Mark, um, regardless of you know what you might see in this text alone, thread it through what you've been doing with Mark all along. You know, if, uh, if, if you're feeling this is a time to sort of attack and you haven't been attacking, don't do it now. Um, if, if this, if you have gone through uh, Mark in a way where you have been more challenging, um, then uh, it would be consistent for you to hold that challenging tone, but to be sure that you do it in a way that is attentive to the caregiving that a pastor must always do. Um, uh, as was noted last week, uh, I think Matt brought this up and Caroline, you just reiterated 
the scribe that we're talking about this week is a different type, different the scribes that are being addressed this week are different than the scribe that sought Jesus last week. And so in your language, uh, if you're going to be a bit harsh, do not be absolutist. Do not act as if anybody in this particular category is to be uh, uh, a monolithic example of everybody in that particular category. I think the gospel does not allow you to do that. And so, Caroline, I thank you for reminding us to think of the thread that we've been preaching all along this year. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, he he castigates the Jewish leadership, not because they're Jewish, not even because they're leaders. It's a castigation of hypocrisy. And if you can't find hypocrisy in your own religious community, you're not looking hard enough. So, <laughs> um, so we need to sit with yeah. this uh, carefully yeah. as leaders, because somebody's got to pay for those long robes and... Um, <laughs> Oh boy! Right? Okay. How many churches would how many churches would wither away if if it weren't for widows and their generosity? Don't get yeah. me started. So oh, um, that's just true. Don't get me so started on community. robes. Pardon me. <laughs> Don't get me started on robes. Okay. Oh, I thought you were talking about the widows. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I'm no. Oh, yeah. All right. So no that's got to be talked about. Like, I don't know what the modern comparisons are to those who devour widows' houses or how that's done, but. I would think predatory lenders are one of the, I mean, you can think of all kinds of businesses or all kinds of schemes, you know, if you don't watch more TV from <laughs> four to 7 PM and kind of see what's being marketed to whom. But I, you know, what's fascinating about this passage is, uh, is the question of how to relate the two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. Jesus has pretty much finished in the temple. Chapter 13 will start next and they'll be walking out and they'll say, look at these large stones, what beautiful buildings. And we see who pays for those buildings and those stones. And so the same people who are devouring widows' houses have made it so that there's a woman in Jerusalem who has only two coins to her name. And that woman somehow feels a compulsion to give that money to the temple. And I don't think Jesus is calling her a sucker. But I think he is by pointing her out saying, can you believe this? <laughs> How come there's not a scribe at the box saying, no, you, you keep that money. In fact, here's some more. That's what the system of alms collecting is supposed to be about in the first place. Yes. So it's a tough text for stewardship season because we want to lift her up as this exemplar of giving. And she is. We don't know her motives. We don't know if she's giving out of fear or love or what. And so, so I don't want to get into her head, but we do know that he's just criticized scribes for being way too ostentatious. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who control the system. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the other, I think what you said earlier too, Matt, is important for interpreting this passage, particularly, as you said, is it, you know, in stewardship season and such, but on the one side of, of her, offering is the denouncing of the scribes. And on the other side is the denouncing of the disciples saying, Ooh, wow, look at these great buildings. Look at these big stones. And so <laughs> bracketing her mm -hmm. are these observable, these observable manifestations of potentially corruption or, uh, or how, how does this how do these? How does this get to happen? Mm -hmm. Who's on on whose backs? As you said, does this uh, does this has this come to be? And so it really it it really does force the preacher to say what is what is Jesus holding up here? I mean, I've heard a bajillion sermons saying, you know, the good thing here is that you know she go, she gave more than the wealthy gave because she gave all that she had. And then, uh, but it, but uh, at the same time, that's to what extent that becomes an easy out <laughs> if you if you ignore the condemnation of the temple workings or the or the hypocrisy or the uh, the malfeasance or whatever what, the corruption that is happening that someone who has all she has is allowed to do that, and so uh, so it. I think that could be a really different sermon around stewardship to say that that, that is the angle or that's the lens through which to, you see how is it that we 
where where and how is it do we give to these religious institution or these religious structures and in what capacity and and in what motivation what do we expect out of it mm. uh, and so I, I think it could raise a lot of really important questions about why stewardship to begin with uh, why do we give to the church what 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 does that what does that all, how, how are we working that all out in our heads and in our hearts uh, as, as ones who uh, support the church in one way or another? And we should just name this as hard, right? It's, it's, it's easy for us to talk about this, but we also work for academic organizations that would not exist if it were not for the generosity of givers and, and, and preachers are preaching to the people whose generosity keeps the budget going and allows them to be in that position. So, I mean, I, I think the way through that is to be honest about it and just say this is most, most preachers I know, it's hard for me to give. It's hard for me to trust God in this. I'm easily coerced and I'm easily, <laughs> you know, figure out ways to make the church's uh, a, a course of instrument if I'm not careful. And just to talk about how a kind of transparency has got to be part of that, but not just transparency in terms of tracking the dollars and cents, but transparency in the sense of why are we giving? Why do we say this to be good for us? Why would God commend almsgiving? What does our budget look like? Who's benefiting off of this? What, what does outreach look like? And then to go back to last week, what does it mean to have a budget that honors love of God and love of neighbor above all else? Mm -hmm. It's important in conversations that, to have, I think. Absolutely. And in that, um, uh, what does it mean to have a budget that is loving uh, God and loving neighbor, na neighbor is the practices that this is, this is um, evident of that um, she's trusting God. She doesn't have to covet what she doesn't have because she's trusting God will provide. Um, uh, Caroline, you mentioned uh, out of, you know, what is in our heart as we're giving. Um, so I think both of you have put on how this particular text needs to be woven in with what we've said the weeks before, whether we were referencing, um, you know, how do we love God and love neighbor, or whether we're referencing who we are criticizing uh, the scribe or identifying who is the neighbor. Um, make sure that our texts are woven together from week to week. This is a perfect example of doing that. Should we go to Zarephath? Yes. Another Let's see. Widow. What could what could the connection be? Oh. Let me think <laughs> about oh, this. Oh, 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 ask me. Ask me. Ask oh, me. Oh, oh, Joy, Joy, you have your hand up. I I think it's a widow. I think it's a widow. Huh? 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 Good job, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, did I just say this? But, you know, <laughs> here it is, uh, the invitation for this woman to trust God. Uh, <laughs> it is remarkable that she does what Elijah says instead of like yeah. throwing rocks at him and saying, get out of my yard. I mean, it is. Dude. Um, it's easy to look at what Elijah says and just be like, dude, read the dude. room. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it is remarkable that for whatever reason, she's trusting hospitable, whatever, you know. Um, and this is the middle of a drought. Everybody looks terrible. Everybody's mm -hmm. dying in the process of dying. And that's, I mean, there's, st there's stats about this, right? This, uh, that poor people, hungry people are way more likely to help each other out than anybody else yeah. is likely to help them out. So that's. Yeah. Part of it too, but there's a, there's a, a, I think this is an example of some kind of faith, whatever we want to, faith in whom or how or what, we don't know yet, but. Yeah. And there's not a change for her. I mean, she was going to, she was going to have this and die anyway. So sure. You know, join Maybe us on company. our last, yeah. on our last supper, you know. Um, yeah. But I, I really do appreciate uh, the fact that there are these, there, there's recognition that when Others around us are suffering like us. We tend to be generous. And when we seem to have a little bit more power, when we seem to have a little bit more privilege, when we seem to have a little bit more control, 
we forget where we came from or we forget those who aren't there with us. And um, I think that's, that's worth noting, particularly if we think about the other texts that are in this, this week's options. And, you know, and as you pointed out, Joy, in terms of this, is it about this, the capacity to trust in God? And, and, and I know that that, I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard <laughs> when you wonder, okay, what, uh, yeah, I, w- I need to be able to pay my bills and all yes. those kinds of things. And the, uh, But verse 14, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. What a promise. And, yeah, and I think that could be, you know, that could be, uh, if, you're, if it ends up being a stewardship kind of sermon or something, that that could be a really meaningful refrain. Mm-hmm. For people to hear that over and over again, uh, I know I need to hear it over and over again. <laughs> I I do. And Matt, uh, I think it was you when we started. Um, you were, you know, teasing like, "Come on, Elijah, read the room." Um, preachers, read the room of your congregation um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as. Um, clear as this particular episode is in its rehearsal, um, it also can be a metaphor for loss uh, that your congregation might be experiencing in some way Mm -hmm. or another. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're still trying to recover after the losses of the pandemic and you are in the midst of stewardship, this refrain that Caroline has yeah. lifted up could be that promise that God isn't done with us yet. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, you know, we're still and so here. We're still here. <laughs> we're still and here. So we are going to trust. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's, oh, go ahead, Caroline. You were, I was going to move on, but you're. I was too. I was, oh. <laughs> I would say this is where the Psalm is. Your. That's what your, I was going to say. Your best lectionary friend this, this week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I, I know I say this, as, and I, I always say, I always say this all the time. I say this all the time, and that is, this, this would be beautiful in a sermon or as a, as a response to the sermon, as a confession of faith, uh, mm-hmm. as a prayer, uh, as a dismissal or a blessing, uh, where, where we're all together, relanguaging that the jug will never, you know, be empty <laughs> um, because, because of in whom we have put our trust. I would like to heavily encourage this Psalm to be included in the liturgy in some way mm-hmm. this week, uh, mm-hmm. partly uh, because it fits the text so well, but also in at least in the United States, but there are other similar things happening around the world. Um, just a reminder that we gather each week to tell the story of God with us so that we remember who it is that we do put our trust in um, and why we trust God, that what God's justice looks like that we are to uh, embody in our lives. So it, if, if there's ever a time for us to use this psalm, I would, I would like to highly encourage it. Especially as, I mean, I, I think this is what you're saying, Joy, but especially at least in the context of the United States, the Sunday after an election, exactly. where it looks, it looks bleak with, for some. depending on what side you're on, yeah, uh, yeah. the bleak, the bleakness will be very much present and the lack of hope and, so, yeah, and I, I hope so. that that is true within your congregations, not just in the congregation across the street. People will be saying, where is God? Anyway, <laughs> um, for various reasons. Uh, yes, everything you both are saying about the psalm. I also, you know, I, I don't preach on psalms. Um but, but you can reference them and and pull them in. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with preaching on Psalms. It's just, but 
There's something about this psalm that makes some claims that at one level appear to be false, about God executing justice for the oppressed, giving food to the hungry, setting prisoners free, lifting up those who are bowed down, upholding the orphan and the widow, the way of the wicked God brings to ruin. I mean, in other words, you can um, click open the news any day and find horrible stories that make you say, where is God in the midst of all of this? But if the psalm is both a praise to God but if it's also in some secondary way a um, a call to action for the rest of us to be the means by which God does this, that's also quite interesting, right? How is this not we sit back in our comfortable robes and our seats of honor at the banquets, right? But we see ourselves called into this kind of compassion, this kind of solidarity, this kind of generosity, again, it is stewardship season that part of what we're called to do is to find where God is active or to be a part of these, these from a Christian perspective, these kingdom principles around justice mm -hmm. and around freedom and around uh, restoration. Um, so to see that too, right? If, it, if we look at these and think they're not true, it might be because some religious people aren't doing all they could be doing, <laughs> including ourselves. Yeah, we believe, but we don't behave to reference um, a couple of weeks ago, the text. Yeah. Ruth. Thank you for that. Ah, so if you're hijacking Ruth. <laughs> or hi oh, yeah, hijacking the season for more, the sake of weeks. Ruth. <laughs> there we right. are. That's right. Hijacking the mm -hmm. season for the sake of Ruth. If you're not, then you've skipped ahead quite a bit. <laughs> yes. Where the commentary is helpful to give background of Context. the passages that we have, the sections and episodes in the story that we have skipped. So I would definitely point people uh, to that, to that commentary. Yes. And it also raises some really, really important questions mm. about the realities of where both Naomi and Ruth are in this story. Um, and perhaps what they had to endure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some cultural differences, certainly, that we have to navigate in terms of what in the world is going on in these scenes. Um, <laughs> and just that really, there's such an interesting line in the final verse of the of the, of the reading here of, in, in chapter four, uh, a son has been born to Naomi. <laughs> to imagine Ruth is sitting there like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I just did all the work. Um, right. <laughs> but I mentioned last week, there's a way in which the book is Naomi's story just as much as, if not more so, than it's Ruth's story. That's just a, a statement about the narrative's perspective here, but that um, Naomi's restoration has been complete in part because of this divine-like loving kindness and devotion of her um, of her daughter-in-law. And then, of course, Obed finds his way into the uh, the genealogy of Jesus, David. And I'm, I'm going to use that. Um, I mentioned last week that... Uh, this story is set in the times of Judges, and it's a counter story in the sense of in Judges we see, you know, uh, every uh, in the season before the kings of Israel, people doing what is right in their own eyes. And here we have a story of a faithful woman whose witness becomes an invitation to trust in the God of Abraham and Sarah, but it too ends pointing to the kings. So, uh, whereas the book of Judges ends and moves toward the need of kings, this particular book ends and points to the king, David. And to remind people too, right? Deuteronomy, I'm just looking it up here, uh, I think it's 23, talks about how no, Am no Ammonite or Moabite or their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. Um, you've got you've got places in Torah that say, keep them out. And here you have a Moabite who is um, just in the assembly of the Lord is, is an ancestor of, mm -hmm. um, of, of Jesus, Jesus and of David. Mm -hmm. And so to help people get a sense of that, right. It, again, it's a way to help people see the way in which the Bible is not always a univocal collection of, of texts. And you've got mm -hmm. counter testimony, you've got debate and dissension going on in the pages of scripture. Yeah. Well, Amos too. Go to the Ammonites. <laughs> Whenever we read yeah. even those lines, as and if the they Moabites. are, yeah, right. Whenever yeah. we read even those lines as universal, 
as if, you know, we can just put a label on someone other than and anybody that would be identified with that label. We can cast them aside. We haven't read scriptures well. There are no references to widows in Hebrews 9, 24 to 28. Oh, wait a minute. Well, then what are we going to do? <laughs> we could talk about Platonism. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Oh. Which actually is a really important topic when it comes to this. But anyway. This particular one. And we, we joke about Hebrews a lot because the book is just cyclical in its structure. It keeps coming mm-hmm. back. So if you feel like we've already read this text, you're, you're right. But it's, yeah. it's familiar. Yeah, there's a way in which it's winding around and, and asking us to look at things from slightly different perspectives at different times. But time. also giving us the foundations of our both our soteriology and our Christology. Just to and throw I, in a couple of big words. Big words. <laughs> Since you well, threw in one. Yeah, I think, too, one of the persistent themes of Hebrew as well comes out here, in particularly in verse 26. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. I mean, you have an author who so elevates the work of Christ as the end all of end all. And, and that and there's something in some ways appealing about that conviction <laughs> that you know just keeps going back and that in that and you get this throughout you know that the comparison of the many times and one time and uh just as there were people before but now there's Christ of course the danger of that is to uh to make that distinctiveness into exclusivity about claims of Christ but it's uh, but it does it does invite, like you said, I think you use the word Christology, and you also use the word soteriology. I but did. it does invite us to to think about, and I talk about this with our students a lot, Joy, as you know, what exactly animates your Christology? You know, what is it that, what are these claims about Jesus that you hold on to as central for why you believe in Jesus or what you believe in about Jesus? And uh, and you hear maybe not Hebrews directly quoted, but the way in the which people assume things about Jesus that that Hebrews claims. So Hebrews ends up in ends up in a lot of Christologies. That's just I just think not directly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that there is, is uh, this this rhythm, you know, that is, you know, Jesus compared to Abraham, Jesus compared to Melchizedek, Jesus. Com- you know, it's as as you said, Matt. Have we read this before? Yeah, but it's mm-hmm. pointing over here this time. Same same message, but it's pointing over there this time. Well, and here one of the key points is it's done, right? Like, hey, yeah. guess what? It's done, and that's that can be a liberating thing to be told, right? That this thing is finally taken care of. When you think of like, <laughs> what does that look like? Like, it's done. It's taken care of. The old is gone. Time for the new. And however you want to like put that, um, that should be kind of a you know, exhale moment. Um, and so to help people, I, I would, that would be the mood of the sermon for me is to try to create that feeling that something's been lifted off of your shoulders mm. by the time the service is done or the sermon is done, however you choose to get there. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.